Dojo, and in today's tutorial, we're going to introduce the class concept. This is one of the most important concepts in object-oriented programming, being the programming paradigm that's used in the Zojo language in combination with the event-driven paradigm. But before we even start discussing what a class is and even creating our very first class in Zojo, Let's go back for a moment to our expenses example project. That's one that we made in a previous tutorial in this programming course. So let's focus on the list box column that displays the expenses numeric values. As you probably remember, when we clicked on that column header, we saw how the list box was sorting such values in a lexicographical way instead of using the numeric values themselves. So its behavior is not what we probably expected. As you can see, in the by default sorting implementation, when we click on the total column header, the ascending or descending order of the rows is not the right one. So how can we fix this? Really simple. We'll use something we already know from previous lessons, and that is implementing a new event handler in the list box, specifically the list box class. This offers a good number of event handlers that we can choose from, and among these is one we need to add in order to implement a customized sorting for the, new, for the received values. So as you can see here, the compare rows event handler receives as parameters the two rows whose values we need to compare, and we simply need to return a negative one, zero, or one integer value to tell the list box which one has to be listed before the other one. So returning negative one means that the first value is less than the second one, while returning a zero means that both values are equal, and returning a value of one means that the first value is greater than the second one. Let's add this event handler to our list box control. And as you can see, how we receive as parameters the two rows whose values we need to compare, the column index from the list box, and also the fact that we need to return a Boolean value to tell the list box that we are applying our own sorting, returning true in that case, or returning a false value for the cases where we're okay with the by default sorting. So when it's about comparing the rows from the first column. But one parameter specifically we're interested in is the result where you can see that it's preceded with the by ref keyword. What does the by ref keyword mean? By now, all the values we were assigning to variables are what we call assigned by value copy. That is the variable has its own copy of the received values, so it's not affected by the changes made to other variables. So if we type something like var a as integer is equal to 10, and then var b as integer is equal to a, then both the a and b variables get their own copy of the 10 value. If in another line of code we type something like var c as integer is equal to b, and then we assign a new value to the a variable, then the fact that we changed the value stored by A doesn't mean that both the B and C variables changed their previous values because they're independent from the one stored by A. So A is storing the value 20 and B and C will be storing still their initial values, which is 10. So what happens when a parameter is preceded with the by ref keyword? In this case, you can think of that variable as a kind of alias pointing to the real one. So any change made on that variable will be reflected in the original variable pointed at by it. So if in this case both b and c were by ref variables, then all the changes made on the a variable will also be reflected in the b and c variables. Of course, this is just a rough explanation about by ref, but it will serve 
so you can better understand how the compare rows event handler works. So let's put this into practice. Implementing our customized sorting for the numeric values displayed under the total list box column. The first thing we're going to do is act on the total column of the list box whose index is 1. All the columns of a list box control have their columns indexes numbered from left to right starting with the index 0. So the second one will have an index value of 1. So our code will start comparing the received col column value against 1 because that will be the column whose rows we want to compare. If column is equal to 1, then we will apply our customized sorting. While if another column, if it's another column value, then we will let the list box apply the standard sorting returning a value of false. And when we do our customized sorting, we return the true value. Now the first thing we need to do is get the real values from the list box cells pointed by the row 1, row 2, and the column whose index is 1. Once we get the cell values, we will be in position of being able to compare their values previously converted to doubles. Thus, let's declare a couple of double variables. And assigning to them the values from the required cells from the list box, using for that the stored values in the row 1 and row 2 parameters. In order to access these values, we will use the me keyword. So we'll reference our list box control itself. And then we'll call this cell value at method. If we read the available documentation for this method, we can see that it returns the va value available at the list box coordinates expressed by the two received parameters. That is the row and column values provided. As you can see, we will receive the cell value as a string as a result of calling this method. So we simply need to provide row one and one as parameters for the row and column. And we will repeat the same line of code for the second variable, changing the row parameter so it uses row two. At this point, we already know that both method calls will return string values. So you will already know what we should use in order to convert these values from string to double values. In effect, we need to attach a call to the to double method. So it will be in charge of converting the string representation values to their double counterparts. And now our first value and second value variables will be storing the expected numeric values, so we're okay to compare them. So if first value is lesser than second value, then we will assign the negative one value to the by ref result parameter. If, however, on the contrary, first value is greater than second value, then we'll assign the value 1 to the by ref result parameter. And if both values are equal, then we will assign the 0 value to the by ref result parameter. If we run the app at this point, and we enter some example values in the list box, Now you can see how when we click on the total header, all the rows are sorted as we expect, both in ascending and descending order. So we managed to fix the sorting problem for the column displaying numeric values simply by adding a new event ha handler and a few lines of code. When the item column applies the standard sorting and providing in this case the expected behavior when applied to text string values. 
Now it's time to introduce a very important concept in object-oriented programming, which is the class concept. By now we were just dealing with variables and values without paying attention to some features of the language that in fact we were using and that are related with use of classes. In this piece of code, for example, we're working with several variables that are related with the same expense concept. So it probably would make sense having all of these grouped under the same item. After all, the concept, amount, and probably a purchase date variable are all of the related are all related with the same expense entry. So it would be great having them all under the same object. That way we can work with it later in the app in order to retrieve any of these values for an expense entry. That's why classes exist. But what is a class exactly? Simply put, it's the ability provided by the programming language allowing us to create our own data types. Up until now, we've been working with integer, string, or double data types amongst others. Thus, via the classes, we can add new data types on top of the existing ones in the language. Actually, we can add as many as we need, and with the ability to reuse them again and again on every new app where we need to deal with the same kind of concept or data type. A more formal definition of a class is the ability to describe an object behavior and the methods or functions able to change that behavior. In order to, to describe a class's behavior, we define all of the attributes that will be common to all of the objects created from the class. So what is an attribute? Well, if we take a car as an example of an object, then the attribu attributes that may define all kinds of cars may be its color, kind of engine, size, the number of doors, seats, and on and on. That is attributes or properties that are common to all cars. But every car is different in some ways. Cars can have different numbers of doors or be different colors. So every car object may have some and change its property values without affecting other cars' property values. Enough about cars. How can we add a new class to the project? Really simple. You only need to choose the class option from the insert menu. Once we select that option, a new class will be added and selected in the project navigator with the related sections under the panel inspector, name, super, and interfaces. Let's focus now on the first two, name and super. Let's start by typing the name for our class and this will be the name for our new data type. So we can type expense as our new class data type. Once we assign a new name to our data type, this will be reflected in the Navigator browser, as here you see with any other project item. But what can we do now with our brand new class? After all, the class is not just about a new name, but we want to also add the properties or attributes that will be common to all of the objects created from this class. And by doing that, we only need to select the option to add properties to our selected class item. So what are the properties? Well, you can think about these as variables that are specific to the class where they are declared. Up to this point, we saw how to declare variables in a block of code using, for that, the var keyword and then the variable name and the data type. This is the same as what we can use when declaring properties for a class. So with our class item selected, we only need to choose the add to expense option in the contextual menu and then the property menu item. As a result, the new property will be added and you will be able to access the inspector panel where you can see the same kind of section that the ones we are used to using when we declare regular variables. The name that we want to give to our property, the data type for the values it can handle, and even assign a default value to it. So it will be assigned to the property every time we create a new object from the class. So let's omit the scope section for now. 
Let's just focus on the first three sections of the inspector panel. In the first section, name, which is the name of our first property, we can type concept. So this one will be in charge of storing the kind of concept for an expense object. Let's assign next the string as the property data type. Let's add a second property. And this one will be in charge of storing the amount value for the expense object. Let's name it amount and set double as its data type. And the third property that will be in charge of storing the date information for the expense object. Let's type date as the property name and date time as its data type. This is a data type we haven't used before and as you can guess, it's another one of the already available classes in the Zojo language. And its function is letting us easily work with date and time values and even do the unusual op operations with this kind of value. In fact, everything that we've been using that are UI controls that are available under the library pane are classes. And every time we add a new control to the layout of our windows, pages, or views, what we are really doing is creating a new instance that is a new object from that class. And in fact, what we have just done is the addition of properties to our class is the same that we can find when we select a UI control in our layout and then we access the inspector panel where we can find and change the values for the properties available under that control class. For example, in the case of a text field control, we can change the values of the properties just for that copy or instance. As you can see, if we have two text field controls, then we can see how the first one, we set its text alignment property to the default value, while for the second text field, we set the same property to the right alignment value. If when declaring variables, we use this syntax, how can we declare a variable in order to assign an object to it? Well, that's really simple. As a class is a data type, we only need to follow the same syntax that is, we start using the var keyword, then the name of the variable in charge of storing values of our new data type. For example, we can name it new expense and then try typing the name of our new data type. So we start typing expense and as you can see, this one is already recognized by the IDE auto completion feature. But here we also want to create a new object from the class and assign that new object to the new expense variable, all of it in a single line of code. And when it's about creating new instances from the class, we need to proceed the data type name with the new keyword. So the new keyword is the one we need to use every time we want to create new objects or instances from a given class or data type. In fact, we can think of the class definition as the mold, and in the, in the class instances as the real objects created from that mold or class definition. So every time we use the new keyword, we will be creating new objects from our expenses mold, having every one of these very same sets of properties, while at the same time, these objects can store its own values for these properties. The new expense variable will be storing a new object created from the expense class. And every time we assign or read the values from the object stored in the new expense variable, such values will be the ones just for that object and not others created from the same class. So how can we assign new values to the properties? In the same way we've already been doing every time we read values from the text field controls list box controls, and others. That is, using the name of the instance or variable store in the instance, and then using the dot notation to access the property we're interested in. Here the instance name is total field, and the property we are accessing using the dot notation is value, applying a conversion to double from the value already found from that property. So we can type new expense, and if we type a dot and press the tab key, then we can see all of the properties available for all the instances created from our expense class. 
In fact, you can see how this pop-up menu also includes a little icon at the left side of the property name, giving a visual clue about the data type expected for every property. A double value is represented by a .01 icon. A string data type is represented by two quotation marks and an object is represented by a little box that, as you can see, is the same kind of icon used by the IDE to represent class items in the project browser. If we want to assign a new value to the amount property, then we only need to choose that entry in the menu and then assign to it the double value we want to store on it. In this case, it will be one from total field dot value. To assign a new value to the concept property, then we only need to type the variable name, selecting the concept entry from the auto completion menu, and assign the value to it from the item field dot value. And if we want to assign a new data a date time value, then we need to add start adding a new text field entry to our user interface, so the user is able to type in the date value in the expected format. So let's modify the initial user interface of our app. Adding a new label and text field to it. Let's name this text field as date value. And let's put this label in and text field in the upper section of our layout. Now let's type a comparison statement to see if the date value contents are not equal to an empty string, which would mean that we can process it in order to create a new date time object from the value typed by the user. So it would be new expense dot date is equal to date dot value. And what's the problem here? As you should already know, date value dot value gives us a string while the date property expects a date time object. If we select the help for date time, we can see how that class offers the from string method where it receives a string as a parameter and returns a new date time object, always that the provided string contents are in the expected format, that is year, dash, month, dash, and day. And we can even include time information. With that new information in our hands, we can assign to our date property a new date time object created from the date value passed as an object an argument to the from string method. Let's not forget that the amount property is defined as a double data type while total field dot value returns a string. So we will need to convert the string from total field, dot, total field dot value to a double value using the already known to double method here. In addition, we need to get the value from the data value instance in our comparison. So let's type dot value here. If we run our app at this point, setting a breakpoint in the second line of our code, and we enter some example values, then we will be able to see how our class works, receiving the values in its declared properties. One thing we need to be cautious about is typing the date value because it needs to be in the expected format. Once we click on the add button, the debugger panel comes up and as you can see here initially the new expense value is nil 
That is, there are still no objects assigned to it. As soon as we execute that line of code, a new object is created via the new keyword from our expense class and then assigned to the new expense variable, as you can now see in the debugger panel. If we click now on the expense entry in the debugger, we will access the object's properties. And as you can see, these display their default values. That is zero for a double data type, an empty string for the string data type, and a nil value for the date time property. As soon as we step forward into the code execution, we can see how the amount property displays the value we previously got from the total field value converted total field value converted to a double. That is 100.20 being this one what we typed in that text field. And when we execute the line of code, assigning the item field value to our concept property, this one reflects the value assigned to it. Next, and because we entered some data in the date value text field, the date property receives a new date time object created from that string. And if we click on that object, we will be able to access the date object properties initialized with the year, month, and day that we typed in the text field, among other values available for any date time object. So using the debugger, we were able to see all of the processes involved in the creation of the new objects from the expense and date time classes and assigning the values to their properties. If we continue with the normal execution of the app, we can see how it behaves as expected, adding the new expense entry to the list box. But how useful is it having new expense objects if they are destroyed once the last line of code is executed? The idea behind working with our new expense class is having some kind of mechanism that allows us to access them in other sections of our code, so they may persist even after the execution of this block of code. Well, this is something we'll learn how to do in our next lesson, where we will introduce some data collection types, in addition to expanding the expense class capabilities.